That's no. Cool. They suck. Person. I've been telling you all season, they Philly. They shit on you. Oh. They shit on you. <laughs> Don't you hear me? Jordan Davis, Caleb Carter. Like, they shit on you. Oh. They shit on you. <laughs> they have shit on you. Don't, you, go. Don't you hear me? Jordan Davis, <laughs> Caleb Carter. Like, they shit on you. Kill them. Oh, my goodness. Did he say they, they cock it on them? I hate the style of defense. I hate it. Well, good morning, good friends. Mark Holmes here with my buddy Cowboy Joe Boo, as well as Joe Bear in the house. And as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report without you guys, as well as you ladies, you know that this literally does not work. So let's get open for business here and let's wake up those football gods. Oh my goodness, man. I tell you what, you know, this is two weeks in a row where it ends up seeming like the world is coming to an end. You know, I am a Dallas Cowboy fan for life, and it's a life sentence. It is a life sentence. Sometimes you feel like you've been locked up. You've been held hostage. You've been beat down as a Dallas Cowboy fan. You get trashed. You get disrespected, and you get a whole lot of caca. But we still at least I still come back for more. And today, I feel so much better about my Dallas Cowboys right now than I did when we lost to Miami. It was tough, okay? We know the Cowboys have had a hard way to go um, in the play, excuse me, on the road this year. We just have not been the same team. But we took the highest scoring team in the NFL. We held them to 22 points and a couple of plays here and there. And, and you have to look at this game and say, we weren't even at our best. We weren't even at our best. And we went toe for toe on the road with the highest scoring offense in football, held them to 22 points and had a chance to win. Our offensive line was crap. Terrence Steele, you know, you're seeing articles out there that maybe the Cowboys should bench Terrence Steele. I don't know for who, although they said when Tyron Smith comes back, put a go to over for Terrence Steele. And a go to, oh my God. <laughs> I, I had to laugh when I saw that one this morning. I had to literally laugh because he doesn't know the assignments on the left side. And so now you want to confuse him and put him on the right side and bench a guy you're paying $82 million for, right? Okay, that, there we go. That's the solution. It is what it is at this point. You can't bench Terrence Steele as long as he's healthy. You don't have a guy that's ready to go. Igota is not the answer. He is a backup. He is when we need somebody, we have to put him in. But if we can get Tyron Smith back for the playoffs, which everything from this point forward, from this point, you know, if we end up getting, you know, winning the division, which is still a possibility after seeing how poorly the Eagles played last night, congratulations to you. You got to win. But to have, you know, Tommy Cutlets and then um, Jacoby Brissett. No, who, uh, damn, I can't even, I can't even remember uh, who it was uh, that came in. Uh, look, I'm old. They ain't changed quarterbacks so often you don't even know. But to have Tommy Cutlets benched and them still have a chance against you with the mistakes you made, Eagles, I, I left at halftime and you guys were up 20 to uh, 3. All of a sudden, mistakes left and right and stuff like that. You know, all of a sudden, here it is, your guy throws a pick six and gets a horse collar penalty. That's history. Like, you you know, you Eagle fans always tell me, Jalen Hurts can do things that Dak Prescott can't. Throw a pick six and get a penalty on it at the same time. There you go, Eagle fans. Congratulations. Congratulations. There you go. Um, are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Isn't that why you were here? Is this not why you were here? Yeah. And I know we did not stop Miami on that last drive, but believe it or not, Miami only got 91 yards on the ground. We will get Hankins back before playoffs. Hopefully we get Tyron Smith back before playoffs. Those are two major pieces that we will have for us. The Eagles, they got to win. Nick Sirianni back to being, you know, you know, pumping his chest and stuff. But dudes, it was against the Giants, you know, at home. Now, I believe we blew those guys out twice. 
at home and away. It wasn't even, it wasn't in doubt at all. We weren't scared. You had Eagle fans booing your team at home with the division on the line and you struggled. Makes me feel better. And as I look at the landscape of the NFC East, as I look at the in- landscape of the NFC East, San Francisco, oh my goodness, a chink in the armor. Remember what I said to you guys about how the NFL, I don't know if, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this would make sense because the NFL ultimately wants to have a team each week that is the team to beat because it gives so much hope in every one of these franchises. We've seen the Cowboys, we were there for a while with our defense early on. Then it was the Miami Dolphins. Then it was the Buffalo Bills. Then it was the Jaguars. It was the Eagles almost the whole season. And then it's San Francisco. Then it wasn't San Francisco. And then it was San Francisco this week. Now it's the Baltimore Ravens. The NFL is getting exactly what they want. They want it to be there is no sure footing. You know, see Kansas City going down the toilet. All these things are bringing more and more fans to watch. You guys don't seem to get the big picture. Ultimately, that's what the NFL wants. They want everybody to feel like they're in it. That's why they ended up putting in two more playoff teams. That gives two more cities that have hope of making it. If they could, they would just say, we're going to have a 32-game tournament for playoffs. Don't think that they wouldn't if they could. They want everybody to be relevant. They don't want a juggernaut team. San Francisco, Brock Purdy, it's it's almost comical to me because Brock Purdy has a four-interception game, four-interception. And here I have San Francisco fans saying, well, you know, three of those interceptions, they, they, they were, were flukes. They, they, they weren't on the quarterback. Where was that energy when Noah Brown's tipping the ball up in the air on a perfect pass that should end up keeping the Cowboys in the game to win the game that ends up being a pick six. I don't hear nobody saying that was just dumb luck and it wasn't on the quarterback. You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you, know, you guys know you're hypocrites. But be that as it may, San Francisco getting beat down by Baltimore Ravens. And this definitely puts Lamar Jackson, even though he doesn't have that many touchdown passes, in the MVP driver's seat. Again, the new flavor of the week. And the Baltimore Ravens. So now you see San Francisco is not invincible. They can be beat. Maybe there's a blueprint out there on what you have to do. And it may be that Dak... You got to use your mother humping legs a hell of a lot more the next time you play San Francisco. You just have to. Eagles, I'm sorry, you guys are a grease fire. You are a grease fire just waiting to just engulf the place. And we'll find out about the Lions this week. Now, here's where it gets to be cray cray. It's been a crazy season because we've had to root for San Francisco, which just literally made me just want to just toss my cookies. I literally, after that game, had to get up and take a shower because I felt so dirty. I was literally slumming. But the one thing we have not had to do is root for the Eagles. In this point in my life, I think I would literally, literally, just rather lose than to ever root for the Eagles. But my friends, the Eagles may have to do just that this weekend. Root for the Cowboys to beat the Lions for them to have a chance at getting home field. See, San Francisco losing now opens up the doors because you have the Rams that have to play them as well that are fighting for their playoff lives. Division opponent usually plays well against San Francisco. It's not inconceivable that the Rams might get a win against them, which really throws everything into chaos. Right now, the Lions could be the number two seed. So the Eagles need us to knock them down if they have a chance of trying to get the number two seed. So this is where things get kind of convoluted. And in my mind, from this point forward, you want to win, but you want to do everything possible to make your team the best team it can be that second weekend in January. 
to be ready for the playoffs. That means if you have guys that are kind of not really there, you may want to go ahead and rest them, especially against the commanders. You want everybody as healthy as possible. Now, the second thing I want to talk about here, well, um, actually, I've kind of gone on quite a bit more, and maybe I'll save that for later because um, it, it's just a lot. It's a lot where we're talking about Micah Parsons and his frustration with the officials. And it seems like now, and I don't know if this is because there's so many eyes and so many cameras that now everything's in high def. You can slow it down and look at it and things. You know, it's brought a whole nother controversy because you can take a snapshot of a moment for one instance, okay? And you can have a play where you look and see there's a guy who's wide open right over here. And he may be, but you might not see the robber that's over in the corner. Or you may end up not seeing what's going on. It may end up being that the quarterback had one and a half seconds because a guy is bearing down on him and there's somebody blocking his vision. But you, as Joe the fan that has a picture where you're not where the quarterback is, and this is where I would love, I would love if the NFL could do this. Get yourself like a little mini camera. You know, you, you, they've got those little tiny cameras that, that people, that the peepers get and stuff like that. But put one of those like in the screw hole of a helmet so you could actually see what it is like to be an NFL quarterback from that ball being snapped to you, getting in your hands and having literally 1,001, 1,002 throw. That's it guys. 1,001, 1,002 throw. 1,001, 1,002 throw. And for you to sit around and think, oh my God, how did he miss that guy? He's wide open. I'd like to see you try to catch the football, get in position, set your feet, find, look at three or four guys while you've got people that want to take your head off. It's not as easy as you make it sound. It's not as easy as sitting on your living room where you can slow it down and look at that same play 20 times. It's happening right now. Be that as it may, be that as it may, it's hard. And because of all of the cameras, all the angles and all the coaches films and everything else, we see things that probably have been missed for years because we missed them as well. We didn't see the officials, uh, you know, all of this stop and go and everything else. And now it feels more like a tragedy. That being said, Sometimes you see an official looking right dead at the play and somehow missing guys just getting just about raped on the field. I'm sorry. Let me take that one back. I'm sorry, because uh, I don't, that, there's nothing. It's not it's not anywhere close. But you understand what I'm saying, that they are literally getting pulled, dragged down, thrown on the ground and tackled. And it's not called. And yet you have questionable ones where. You know, Mike had just touched this guy, kind of like back a few years ago when we were playing the Raiders, and here it is, Derek Carr ends up scrambling, and Micah Parsons touches him like that, and he gets an unnecessary roughness. You know, it's kind of like you start questioning on, you're going to be that ticky-tack on those penalties, but somehow you miss the egregious ones. Somehow, in almost nine games, there has not been a single offensive lineman holding Micah Parsons. Not a single one. That's freaking amazing. Shout out to those nine teams for not getting a single holding penalty on uh, guys blocking Micah Parsons. So there's a lot there to go into it. So I'm, I'm going to save that for a little bit later. In the meantime, I want to go ahead and listen to Get Up. They're not talking about the Cowboys in this one. They're talking about Lamar Jackson, who has been the dark horse for MVP. You got to have to say it. He, you know, right now he's got 19 TD passes. Um, not a lot, but what he means to that offense, he is that offense and 45 yards rushing and they bitch slapped and, and he literally went after Mike Farello and basically told him you need to respect, you know, I, that's the guy who's on the mission right now. Uh, RG3 just showed us. Open and shut, right, Jeff? MVP. Uh, no, no, not open. Oh, oh what? I, 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 right. I, 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 listen, I'm, I'm all for Lamar played fantastic. They dominated that game. Five turnovers on defense obviously helps towards uh, th those numbers. But when you look at the MVP in, in totality, 
I would say that Christian McCaffrey, I would say Tyreek Hill, if he ends up getting 2,000 yards. Like, when you look at Lamar's numbers overall, like, he's 15th in passing. I know he leads. He's got 700 yards rushing. He does the thing his team. He's the most valuable player on his team, there's no doubt. And if the award goes to the best or, or the most or, or the quarterback on the best team in the league, Lamar definitely is going to win that, right? But if, if you're looking at this as, a, as an award that could go to someone other than a quarterback, Look no further than the running back on the other team last night, yeah. who well, Purdy's giving the ball away at a at a, a an easy clip. McCaffrey played great again, right? I mean, this guy has over 100 yards rushing. He's involved in the pass game. He's going to complete drives, score touchdowns. It's what the guy does. So, do I love Lamar? Absolutely. But am I handing it to him? If I'm John Harbaugh, I'm doing the same speech he sure. did, right? You know, cameras are in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going for my guy as well. And he he's in the conversation. But if it's a quarterback award, Lamar will get it. If it goes to, you know, if Hill gets 2,000, which I'm not sure he will because of the injury, or McCaffrey stays on the pace he does, if it's the most valuable player in the game, I mean, McCaffrey's got almost 1,400 yards rushing. Yeah. He's got over 500 pass. He's got 21 touchdowns. Like, you look at all the things the guy has done. Uh, same for Hill. If Hill gets over 2,000, it's just those numbers are crazy. We saw it. The graphic was up. I hope we can put it back up with the MVP odds right now. Uh, Lamar now the favorite. Last week, Purdy was the favorite. Uh, so you can see how volatile this has been uh, week to week. It's just that kind of year uh, in that MVP oh, race. Oh, Purdy might be out. I'm not sure you even want to waste that plus 1,400. After, Purdy is uh, not. He, he, uh, a four-interception night will bang up your MVP odds, yeah. I think, uh, especially historically, late in the season. especially at yeah. this time in the season. So I, I do want to talk about the 49ers, though. Like, yep. I mean, we, this was unstoppable juggernaut team like who can possibly do anything like uh, it was last night we the game we play is bad game or bad sign what was that for the Niners last yeah I think it was a bad game for the 49ers Uh, listen at the end of the day if you didn't love that game last night you just don't like football amen right it was a physical affair one in the trenches and the thing that popped out to me at least from the 49ers was it felt like they were trying to win the MVP whereas the Ravens were just trying to win the game. Mm. So Brock Purdy, obviously the three tip picks, listen, there's nothing he can do about that. But the way that they played, they, the, the numbers support the fact that they tried to run the ball with Christian McCaffrey. Right. But they weren't as consistent early, they early in the game running the ball with Christian Agreed. McCaffrey when they had success doing it. So to me, seeing Brock push the ball down the field, one run, three play action passes, instead of two runs and two play action passes, They have to get back to just trying to win the football game and not worry about the numbers that are going to come along with that. I just thought that Brock Purdy did the one thing that Lamar didn't. He forced some things down the field that he didn't need to. Yeah. And the Ravens took some advantage of it. Well, I think I think early on you saw it, right? You get down to the red zone, and we just talked about what McCaffrey has done so well. Yeah. And, and, and listen, you're throwing a ball into – I mean, there's no – I don't care who, how long you've been playing quarterback. You can right. look at that. When he threw the ball, I'm screaming no, no, no <laughs> on TV. You're seeing a whole lot of white jerseys back there. Mm-hmm. I think the moment for Brock Purdy, once that interception happened, you saw him begin to press, right? And, and you know, so he's he sees there's going to be a blitz off, so he pulls the ball, which is the right call. He didn't have a good window. Like at some point, like to, to, to Robert's point about sometimes the best play is to pull it down, try to get what you can get. Let's play the next down mm-hmm. instead of right. trying to force things. He started to try to force balls in there. He's running the sideline, throwing across his body. Again, it hits Kittle, and there's another interception from him on the ground. All of those are plays where you're trying to make the big play. Correct. And, and, and there you go. Putting the ball in again, you're doing harm's way. Your team and help your team in those type of situations. Nick, did uh, did the uh, Ravens expose something here for the 49ers? Is this a sign of trouble for them? Well, I mean, it's only a sign of trouble if the 49ers have to keep playing the Ravens every week because it seemed like yeah. the 49ers punched everybody in the mouth and out physical every team they play, but they couldn't do that to the Ravens. And not mm-hmm. to say that they aren't as physical as the Ravens, but a lot of teams crumble under that pressure that the 49ers had, and we saw a different version of the 49ers last night. Once Brock threw that, uh, that red zone interception against what it looked like was cover six. It seemed like the play calling got a little less aggressive, Mm -hmm. a little bit more conservative to protect Brock Purdy. And then there were some unlucky tips that ended up in interceptions. And the Ravens, excuse me, the 49ers defense was the most concerning part about last night's game is it felt Mm -hmm. like they were fighting hard early to create those uh, red zone stops, but they couldn't hold on for the course of the entire game. And their D-line has historically been the strength of that defense, but they had little to no impact on last night's game. If they're not going to win in the places where they have advantages, then they're not going to beat very many teams. Fortunately, there aren't a lot of teams like the Ravens in the NFL. Yeah. All right, we're going to leave it right there with that.
There is definitely a chink in the armor, and in a one-game playoff, anything can happen. All right, good people, I got some work to do. Uh, today, 1 o'clock, me and Game Time Brian are going to have a discussion. Should we feel better about the playoff possibilities, or is it time to panic? And that's what we have for you. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day. It's already Taco Tuesday. It is going to be going by fast, and we will be ready to take on. Oh, man, the Detroit Lions. I'm Mark Holmes, and I'll see you soon. Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of the Joe Boo Sports Report. And the only thing else I got to say is, how about